afternoon. My name is Rebecca Renell. I'm from the University of the Highlands and Islands, and I'm the project researcher and coordinator for SURF, which has been referred to a couple of times in its uh, in original development name as the Three Island Framework, um, and is now Scotland's Island Archaeology Framework. And I'm delivering this talk today on behalf of sort of the wider project team, which includes Jane Downs um, and Julie Gibson, Kevin Murphy, and Val Turner. And in this really short presentation, I just want to try and make sort of three main points. I really want to just introduce you all to our project, make you aware of it, and hopefully encourage people to be stakeholders. Um, I want to, secondly, I want to kind of convince you, if you need convincing, that islands need to be thought about differently, particularly small island groups, when we think about regional frameworks. And finally, I want to suggest that we would benefit from sharing some of our strategies for island research at a European or perhaps even international level. So I'm just going to begin by introducing our project. I'm going to talk a little bit about the multi-scalar island approach that we're sort of developing. And then I'm going to try and identify some island-specific research challenges and opportunities, some of which are uh, specific to Scottish islands and some islands more generally. Um, so the project, SURF, it's coordinated by UHI Archaeology Institute in partnership with the local authority archaeologists um, in, in West Niles, that's the Cordia, and then Ellen Shear, the Orkney <coughs> Islands Council, Shetland Community Trust, and the project is being supported by Society of Antiquaries and the uh, SCARF project, which we've obviously just heard about now um, and previously. And the project's also been very generously funded by Historic Environment Scotland as part of Scotland's archaeology statue. Um, so the project just started in July this year, so we're really at the beginnings. Um, uh, and still developing our strategy in many ways. Um, but I should also point out that it's quite a timely um, point in which to start an island framework. Uh, as you may or may not know, that Scotland's Island Bill in, came out in 2017, and this ties on lots of those themes there. Um, the aim of this project is to develop research frameworks for these three regions in the first three years. As you'll see, our structure starts off in the West Nile, Shetland and Orkney. And then in year four, we're going to pull together an overarching island archaeology framework where we'll be looking at all these regions together, but also Scottish islands more generally. Oh, there we go. Um, nicely ties in with the talk uh, Peter's just given that um, we, we will structure our framework chronologically. We'll be tying it in with the chronological terminologies and framework of SCARF for all of the good reasons that I think we've just been given. But we also want to think about a few themes, um, themes that uh, tie these islands together. And the themes that we've got here um, came out of uh, an open, uh, open session discussion we had at a conference last year in Orkney, Our Islands, Our Past, um, where everyone contributed to, to bringing these themes out. So then a little bit about what we're calling our multi-scalar approach. Um, it's kind of evolved out of our discussions about the way in which regional and national frameworks articulate. Um, obviously, SCARF is the starting point, the national framework, first published in 2012, and then the uh, call made by HES um, in the archaeology strategy in 2015 for regional strategies, which we've responded to. So for us, the next scale down, uh, the regional scale, will be this island-wide framework. And sitting within this will be the individual islands, or archipelagos, um, those individual frameworks. But because we, we live and work in islands, and we think about islands a lot, at least I do, um, we, we see there as being another scale, a scale again, and that's the scale of islands within islands. Um, just as, a, as an example here, I'm going to look at the Western Isles as a sort of little mini case study, it's where we started. Um, the Western Isles uh, includes 15 inhabited islands, but in fact, archaeologically, we find evidence for exploitation or habitation of one kind or another from 50 of those islands within the archipelago. Um, we also recognise that there's a, there's a tendency amongst researchers to make islands of themselves and their research. Um, and the result, result can sometimes be isolated narratives um, for particular islands within these archipelagos and then gaps, large gaps in between. So one of the many things that we'd like to achieve with this framework is to encourage discussion about this discussion around the validity of these isolated narratives and encouraging our stakeholders to think, um, to think about inter-island research opportunities. 
The islands I'm thinking of in the West Niles, if those of you are familiar with the West Niles, would be places such as St Kilda, Shant, um, and even larger islands like Benbecula, where although there's lots of work, they sit isolated, sort of out with the, the kind of broader narratives. Um, just a, a really important, very basic point to make, which is that archaeologically across this region, um, we find for some periods there's lots of evidence suggesting links, um, shared aspects of material culture, etc. Conversely, for other periods, we find exactly the opposite. And I just want to emphasise that by considering these regions together, we're not overlooking any of those differences. And in fact, it's those dynamics that we're really interested in exploring. Um, we also find that there are different relationships between these island groups and the mainland, and that's another, another dynamic that's very interesting. Um, so why study these islands together? And it's because we want to share um, experiences, we want to understand the challenges and the opportunities, and we see huge potential for collaborating and learning from one another by doing this. To just look a little bit at some of these challenges, as I've said, some are specific to Scottish islands, some are island-wide or island-wide issues. Um, for those of you, I think quite a lot of us were actually, I recognise some faces, were at the climate uh, change session yesterday. A lot of these issues were covered in, in a lot of fascinating detail. But islands are vulnerable environmentally, um, Scottish islands in particular. Um, we have issues of increased storminess, uh, sea level rise, and coastal erosion are really huge issues for us. So it means that when we identify research priorities, many of them need to be addressed really, really soon. Um, so that urgency is going to often, well, well, will have to be a major part of these research frameworks. And I just wanted to point out as well that this, this, uh, this argument has been really expertly made by the Scape Trust in their work, um, looking at coastally eroding sites in Scotland. Um, and I believe that there's been about 12,000 sites in Scotland uh, identified. This has been whittled down to 322 high priority sites. Um, but two thirds of these are in the northern and western Isles, and that's uh, that's really crucial to understand, you know, how we're going to be thinking about this framework. Um, but in addition, islands are also remote places in, in loads of senses of that word. Um, this has accessibility and resource implications for how we carry out research, um, but also there's a there's further sort of scope for separating the research locales from people who are just carrying out the research and those research outputs. I think this is a real challenge for anyone carrying out research in Ireland, and we need to think about it. On a more positive note, islands offer immense uh, opportunities for research. Um, I don't have time to go into any of these in, in much detail, but the exceptional preservation conditions is one that is very specific, I think, to the Scottish <coughs> islands that we're talking about. We have um, relative lack of development means that uh, lots of our deposits are, remain undisturbed when they would be relatively uh, disturbed in other places. Traditional land management, such as crofting, means that upstanding remains are less affected. But we also are really lucky to have these amazing preservation environments. We've got peat, we've got maca, and these uh, preserve archaeology very well. Um, these themes here I've sort of brought together from a variety of sources, but in particular I point people to the article by Scott Fitzpatrick from 2015. Um, the, the huge potential for modelling for future sustainability is really, really key and something that came up um, in several sessions that I've been at over this week. Um, where am I going now? But as we, as we all know, um, archaeological research doesn't just inform us about the past, it obviously informs us about the present and looking into the future. Um, and the Scottish islands, like many of the world's islands, are really vulnerable places socially um, and economically, um, as well as environmentally. And there are a range of complex reasons for this that um, I know we, don't, we don't have time to go into, but things like population decline, remoteness, and environmental change all, all play a role there. Um, and we believe that a, a framework for archaeological research that looks at Scotland's islands needs to consider these factors <coughs> um, that are all recognised at sort of national, European, and international level. Um, and it's these... Uh, uh, bodies of work that we'll be referring to in this legislation in order to be mindful to these um, uh, impacts. And one of the interesting things that all of those documents refer to um, is that they all agree that heritage and culture are key assets for small islands. Now perhaps the most obvious um, example of that would be in sustainable tourism. The picture here probably very familiar to people will be the Ring Brodga, which is part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. But there are other things as well where um, culture and heritage are really important to island communities. Um, they contribute to a strong sense and cohesive identity in small island communities. Um, and 
again, coming back to this sort of sustainability issue, archaeological research can provide lessons for building more resilient and sustainable communities in our, in our islands. Um, so just some very simple concluding thoughts. Islands offer distinct challenges and opportunities for archaeological research. Um, we just need to be aware of that. They invite us, I think, to think critically about boundaries and scale, and that's actually been a lot of the discussion I think we've had already today kind of keys into that. Um, we have hard boundaries, it seems, on islands, but we need to think about the fluidity as well. Um, and again, archaeological research has the potential to play an important role for island regeneration. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to say thank you to um, the people who've uh, contributed to this. And the final thing I want to leave you is just of an invitation. We've, as I say, we've only started this project in July. Um, so we haven't got a firm date yet, but we are hoping to have our first big meeting for this framework in the West Niles in hopefully the first week of December. So I'd say, please save the date. If you want to know anything more about what we're doing, would like to be involved in any way, please get in touch with me. But I'd also be really keen to establish some contacts with other island archaeologists um, and think about islands a bit more, more generally, with people who are willing and interested. Thank you very much. Thank you.